afternoon, everyone, and uh, good evening to those of you who are in Japan and in Asia. Good morning to you if you're in Europe. I'm Yudhita Rikamadyar, country representative for Europe South Japan. And a very warm welcome to our speakers today and our attendees in the room. So what will you hear today? Our event outlines the overall Horizon Europe program and discusses the MSC doctoral networks in more details. Today's event is taking place at the Europa House at the EU delegation in uh, Tokyo. And we would like to welcome you in our future webinars connected to MSCA. They will be announced at the end of today's event as well. I'd like to thank you for your participation in the event today on the Marie Sklodowska Curie Actions Doctoral Networks. The Marie Sklodowska Curie Actions, or shortly we call it uh, MSCA, it is the main instrument of the European Union for the mobility, training, and career development of researchers from all over the world. It is a program that has a positive impact, not only on the career of the individual researcher, but also on the participating institutions and research groups, because it creates long lasting collaborations among researchers, but also among the universities, research centers, the private sector, and other non-academic partners. MSCA has five complementary actions, and one of them is the MSCA doctoral network that you will be learning about today. Horizon Europe, which is the European funding program for research and innovation, dedicates 6.6 .6 billion euros to MSCA, and 50% of this amount goes to doctoral networks. Two years ago, we celebrated the 25th anniversary of MSCA. During all of these years, MSCA developed its principles and characteristics, like fair and transparent recruitment, for example, like focusing on transferable skills. These are skills that help the researchers in their careers, but they're not directly linked to the research topic. Like focusing on career development, open science, equality, inclusion, and building sustainable links amongst researchers and innovation partners within Europe and outside Europe. In addition, being bottom up is a very attractive feature for participants. What does that mean? This means that all fields of research can apply from life sciences and physics to psychology, sociology, economics, and law. The most important criterion is excellence regarding, uh, regardless the field and the discipline or the topic of the proposed research. Very importantly, MSCA is open to countries outside Europe, including Japan, of course. In fact, many Japanese researchers and institutions have participated in MSCA, and there is potential for even more extensive participation. In the first two calls of Horizon Europe, which is in 2021 and 2022, Japan participated in 32 MSCA projects. And there are more calls to come every year in Horizon Europe until 2027. Today, you will be hearing about the MSCA doctoral networks, the largest of the five MSCA actions and the most effective in creating durable links between research partners worldwide. These durable links are part of what we call the structuring effect, which is the positive impact MSA doctoral networks that is maintained after the project is finished, beyond the lifetime of the project. It is the impact on the organizations involved by widely spreading excellence and setting standards for high quality training programs, also for researchers that are not part of the project. That's what we call the structuring effect. In addition to the standard doctoral networks, MSA offers 
two specialized and strategic types of networks. These are the joint doctorates and the industrial doctorates. Joint doctorates are ideal in catalyzing close collaboration between partners. This is because the consortia established together joint procedures that they do together, like the recruitment of the doctoral fellow, the admission, supervision, and the evaluation. And the doctoral candidate, on the other hand, gets maximum benefits from both institutions. They learn from both institutions, joint supervision, and their double or joint degree become very attractive to future employers. The second type is the industrial doctorates, where the doctoral candidate is co-supervised by both the academic and the non-academic partners. And they do the research in both places. So they divide their time between the academic and the non-academic premises. By teaming up with the industry or other non-academic partners, the universities establish new collaborations and become more tuned to the market dynamics and more capable of attracting excellent candidates and gaining more international visibility. On the other hand, the non-academic partner, like industry, for instance, get access to top research talents and tap into a wealth of academic knowledge and know-how. Finally, the doctoral candidate, they get the best of both worlds and they become a natural, attractive choice for future employers. Dear participants, we believe that MSCA doctoral networks offer exciting possibilities for the research community worldwide. And I hope that you will also feel the same after the rich information and discussion sessions planned this morning, this morning in Brussels, by my Euraxis Japan colleagues. On behalf of the European Commission, I thank you again and I wish you a fruitful meeting that I hope will lead to a lot of high quality applications. Thank you. So let me just introduce Dolly Borigan. He is local coordinator at Euraxis Worldwide an expert associate at the Research Center University of Clinical Center, uh, the Republic of Spruska, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and assistant professor at the Faculty of Information Technologies, Pan-European University, Apeiron Banyaluka, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone or good morning to, for, for those in Europe. My name is, uh, as you did said, Dalibor Drljača, and I will give you a brief insight into the doctoral networks as a research mobility program in Europe that is funded through Marie skodowska kiri actions. Next slide, please. Okay, so you did already presented some of my affiliations, but just important to say that I was for a long time the M MSCA national contact point. This is something important for you. The national contact point are those persons that can help you directly if you have to deal some issues with your Marie Skodowska Kiri actions. Next slide, please. So what we are going to, to speak today is about Marie Skodowska Kiri actions in general. And then we will go to the focus of our presentation today about doctoral networks. I will give some advice on how to apply and will give a special insight into the participation of so-called program third countries in the program to which also Japan belongs. Next slide, please. So next slide also. Sorry, I have this some small slides in a break. So the policy background, as uh, uh, Mr. Sohail already said, is that Marie Sklodowska key reactions are supposed to contribute to improvement of European research area, European education area, and external policy objectives of the European Union with a special commitment to some specific documents like European Charter for Researchers and Code of Conduct for the Recruitment of Researchers, which are guaranteeing the transparent process of engagement and employment of researchers at the European institutions. Innovative doctoral training principles are also important, especially for doctoral networks, to ensure that the PhD candidates get the best possible options to study and to complete their PhD studies. Under this, 
are the principles of the open science and open access. These are the two initiatives that are supposed to enable sharing of the data sets of the documents and to open the science to everyone interested to participate in and continue the research on the spot where the researcher has stopped. Also, to ensure the quality of the actions and to ensure the quality of the papers that are produced. We're also having initiative of responsible research and innovation that deals in that deals with the uh, uh, cross-cutting issues such as ethics, gender equality, research integrity, etc. So next slide, please. To have in mind the previous slide, but you also have in mind this slide uh, when you are writing the proposal, because it is important to tackle these issues that are shown here. It is important that your project has impact on research and innovation in general, then to have impact on research and research staff, impact on organization, because these impacts are required to be presented in your proposal. So, uh, Maris Khodovska key reactions are mainly focused on improvement of researchers. And in that case, we are going with a bottom-up approach. The bottom-up approach means that, that the excellence is the key and the researcher is giving the, uh, the researcher is giving the idea for its own research. Training, it means that the transferable skills and the skills needed for career development are going to be offered to the to the uh, uh, PhD students and also the fellows that are participating meeting in the program with a strong in, in, in the international dim dimension. What it means? It means that these uh, proposals have to be in a so-called triple E or triple I environment, which means international, intersectoral, and interdisciplinary. Next slide, please. MSCA characteristics are, have been already mentioned by Mr. Sohail, but on the first place, we need to put excellence because we need to develop the excellent researcher. Mobility is the next one that I mentioned related to the triple I, international, intersectoral, and interdisciplinary with this bottom-up approach. And it is open for all uh, researchers at all uh, stages of career development and also to all nationalities practically. Everyone can participate in this program. Recruitment and employment conditions are guaranteed with, uh, with this European Charter and Code. And for, to have these uh, uh, grants available and to be done in an adequate manner, we need to ensure quality supervision. So it means that the PhD candidates in case of the doctoral networks should be accompanied with really effective supervisors that have significant merit in their biography. Uh, the projects should deal with the European policies, uh, policies and European strategic, strategic orientations, such as green, green digital, digital uh, industry, etc. Synergies with other programs at the level of the European Union are encouraged, like with Erasmus Plus or with the Life Plus program or other programs, because uh, the, uh, we need to... Uh, to avoid redundancies and the duplication of the spending of the money. So next slide, please. Also next slide. So what we need to achieve with the doctoral networks. First of all, doctoral networks are the multi-beneficiary actions, which means it has several institutions. Yes, Maris Kulowska Kiri actions are in principle individual mobility research actions, but the individuals are not getting the funding on their hands, but the funding is given to them through the institutions. So it means, this means these multi-beneficiary actions. Uh, the, the, the point of these multi-beneficiary actions is to set up a doctoral programs and to train certain number of doctoral candidates. There are, as uh, Mr. Luca mentioned, three implementation modes. Doctoral networks providing the trainings in the academia between the institutions, academic institutions, and or with industry, where the main focus of the PhD study is in the academia. If the student wants to have more of its PhD inside the industry, then the industrial doctorates are the ones that are targeted for this kind of collaboration between academic and non-academic uh, institutions or industry because uh, the interest is 
to to create a future researcher that is closer to uh, that, that will do with uh, with research products closer to the market and closer to the commercialization it is important that industrial doctorates are done jointly in the intersectoral supervision so that phd student is going to have two supervisors instead of one one will be from the academic sector and the other one will be from industry then the joint doctorates as a third category is uh, to enable joint collaboration in higher education that leads to either to joint or multiple doctoral degree so this is the formality that the consortium has to negotiate in the beginning when they prepare the proposal and also to select the joint selection and supervision uh, over these over the students so also this joint doctorates is under the uh, uh, under the issue of uh, uh, who and how is going to issue these degrees because every student regardless the implementation modes every phd has to complete its study within the project so it has to get the phd title at the end of the project so this is the the rule that it's needed so uh same scientific panel is for all three kind of uh, uh implementation modes so they are going to be competing under uh, uh, against each other next slide please so the expected outcomes are already described in the work program of the Marie Sklodowska key reactions for doctoral networks but it's important that the benefits are obvious for the doctoral candidates because that candidate is going to complete its PhD and also for the participating organizations because they are participating in this prestigious program and they are going to develop further their uh, third cycle of studies the aim and the uh, uh, outcome is to train creative entrepreneurial innovative and resilient doctoral candidate that is able to fight against these uh, challenges societal challenges and to convert knowledge to ideas therefore I mentioned that uh, uh, especially in the industrial doctorates, we are looking for the candidates that are going to bring the research results closer to the market and closer to the exploitation, and also to achieve sustainable economic and social benefits. And how to do this, how to achieve these expected outcomes, it's through training of researchers uh, in related research and so-called soft skills, and also to connecting these uh, uh, two, kind, uh, two different uh, sectors by developing these transferable skills. With this, we are going to enhance the cooperation and also increase the knowledge uh, between the sectors and the disciplines. And all of this can influence future education policies because based on the experiences from the Marie Sklodowska Kiri actions, we can see the success of this uh, industri uh, uh, academic industry collaboration is growing so that uh, there is uh, some recognition uh, of efforts on the both of the sides and the uh, uh, results of this collaboration are going to be int introduced in the uh, relevant policies. Next slide, please. The expected impacts are to strengthen, first of all, the human capital base, which means we need to have more qualified and more skillful staff. Uh, then to improve researchers' career in Europe with the better working and employment conditions that are guaranteed with the European Charter and Code, then to enhance talent and knowledge circulation in all these sectors, while at the same time contributing the sustainable competitiveness in both of the sectors. The, this will all lead to the fostering of the culture of open science, innovation and entrepreneurship, because this training intends to develop these, these characteristics. Next, next slide, please. So what is the eligibility to participate in the program? First of all, uh, eligibility of the countries that can participate in doctoral network is the same as for all Horizon Europe activities. We have on one side member state countries, then we have non-EU countries and specific cases that I'm going to mention. Member state countries are obliged by the membership in the European Union to participate in this program. Non-European countries can be associated or non-associated countries. So these non-associated countries to the program, we call the program third countries, and 
we divide them into two groups, low and the middle income countries. There can be also specific uh, partners in the program, like EU bodies or international organizations of interest, like uh, Red Cross, Red Crescent, etc., depending on the type of the doctoral network that you are, that you are building, and also about uh, the impact and the objectives of your doctoral network. Next slide, please. Participants, as I mentioned at the beginning, are eligible from where, from all over the world. So uh, the institutions that are participating should be any legal entity established in the, in the country with a, uh, with a, under the legislation that is on force in that country. And the consortium of institution has to co consist of universities and the business. You can include also other socioeconomic actors, for example, if the doctoral network is the field in, is in the field of the social sciences, you can involve hospital, museums, and other institutions that are of interest uh, for, for the development of that study program. There is no maximum number of associated partners, but uh, there is always a kind of a problem of uh, managing large consortium of the, in the project. So the advice is to keep uh, some kind of optimum, and the experience shows that it is up to 10 institutions per consortium in, in the program. Next slide, please. So the participant types we divide between the beneficiaries and associated partners. Beneficiaries are those that are going to be granted with the funds from the European Commission through the coordinator. And the associated partners are those that are helping to beneficiaries to uh, achieve the objectives of the project. So beneficiaries are always those that are dealing with the core tasks in the project and associated partners are, he are helping them in this case. And as you can see, the associated partners cannot participate in the signatories of grant agreement and recruitment of researchers and cannot directly claim the costs. They will claim the costs through the beneficiaries that are supposed to do this task, but they can train participate in supervisory board, and also they can host some of the researchers. Next slide, please. Just to mention that you will be having these slides at the Euraccess Japan website, so you can always recall on these participation rules because sometimes you can just slip it out of your mind. So eligible researchers must be a doctoral candidate, but without a PhD. So they must be in their phase to end the PhD studies during the project time. They can be recruited through the open merit-based and transparent recruitment, which is usually done through the Euraxis Jobs Portal. So this is the place where the competition calls are open and the institutions are publishing the ads there. And you as a researcher willing to participate in the MSCA doctoral network, you go there and find out and I will show that process. It has to be enrolled in a doctoral program I mentioned in at least one EU member state or associated country. In case of joint doctorates, it has to be at least two, uh, two institutions and it can be of any nationality, but it must be respected the mobility rule, not conducting or carrying out the main activity in the recruiting country for more than 12 months in the 36 months before the recruitment date. So it means, if the researcher is going to Japan, the mobility rule is that the main activity or uh, something that is, uh, for example, studying has not been done more than 12 months in the last three years before the recruitment date. So this is the only limitation that is applied to the doctoral network as so-called mobility rule, which, uh, by the way, for the whole program of Maris Kodowska key reactions. Next slide, please. Common eligibility rules is that the size of the project cannot go over 50, uh, 500 for, uh, 540 person months for all three modes of the doctoral networks. This means uh, that uh, you cannot go over this figure. Minimum fellowship duration is three months. So if you are sending the fellow from your institution to another university, that fellow has to spend minimum three months in the mobility and it has to be a cross country or geographical mobility. Beneficiaries must be minimum three independent legal entities from European member states or associated countries of which one must be from the member states. Then after that number is met, you can add additionally 
institutions as much as you need in order to have uh, has the quality of the program. Then the beneficiaries that are involved in the project, they must recruit minimum one doctoral candidate. So they must send one to another institution and receive at least one to, to, to your institution, except for the associated partners, they can just receive the candidates. Then the budget allocation is forcing up to 40% of the contribution per one country. So usually this is dealt between the partners in the consortium, and this is never going that uh, one, one uh, country is going to get more than 40% of the EU contribution. Now it is happening that the proposal is rejected in this call and the next year you would like to apply. If your call, if, if your proposal uh, went below 80% in the previous call, you will be automatically ineligible to apply for the next year. So you need to make a completely new proposal. Next slide, please. So here is just one short example of consortium that you can apply. So these are the beneficiaries. So those that are going to sign the grant agreement and those that are going to get the money directly from the coordinator. You can see that there are three member states or associated country institutions and one member states. The heads represent the students in mobility. And also we have additional two industrial partners here. So they, are, they can be from any of the countries because we met the minimum of three institutions from three different countries. And then to this, we, we add additional associated partners, one from the uh, academy and the other one from industry. So this should give you a picture uh, how the consortium should look like and also how is the movement between the institutions. So these hats here doesn't mean that those are the, the students of this institution. They can be receiving two students, and this one receives only one. So this is not limiting. This is just an illustrative example, just for you to consider what kind of consortium you should need to have for the proposal. Next slide, please. So some specific eligibility rules. The duration is 48 months, except for the joint doctorates where you can go for the up to 60 months which corresponds to these 540 person months, definitely. Fellowship duration is uh, 36 months for the DN and the ID, while for JD you can have up to 48 months. The secondments in doctoral networks is uh, regulated up to the one third of the fellowship duration. What it means? It means that uh, this uh, fellow can be seconded to another institution, but not longer than one third of the total fellowship duration. And uh, specific uh, for industrial doctorates is, I already mentioned joint supervision, but also uh, the doctoral candidate has to be minimum 50% in the non-academic sector during the fellowship. So this is one of the constraints also uh, to ensure that it is really an industrial doctorate. Enrollment in the joint or double or multiple PhD is the condition for the joint doctorates. Uh, joint admission selection, I already mentioned this, and it is important that in the phase of submission of the project, these letters of pre-agreement to deliver these, these degrees are going to be uh, additional annexes to the main contract. So they have to be already in advance prepared, and there is a template for this on a, on a, on a commission website. Next slide, please. Let's look a little bit about the funding now. Next slide. Doctoral networks are having this simplified approach using so-called unit costs. One unit cost means one person month of each eligible researcher. Uh, I have to give you here explanation what it means one person month. One person month is the duration of the workload for one person according to the legislation of that country in one calendar month. So it means if we say that there is a 40 hours work week, it means 160 hours for the whole month. And then this is one person month for Maris Kodowska key reactions. We don't look at the calendar months, we look at the person months in the proposals. 
in case of doctoral network, since the PhD student is going to be 100% engaged in the project, this means the same. But in some other in some other proposals, it can be more than one calendar month. But in this case, we can say that this one person month approximately is one one calendar month, and that's one unit cost. Then the reimbursement is 100%. So there is no co-funding. The project pays for the cost of the of the researcher. And the cost categories are divided in two categories, researcher's cost and institutional cost. Later on, we will show you the unit costs for each of these categories. Next slide, please. So this is what I was talking about. This is the table that you have in the work program, and it's easy to remember. And all the figures here given are expressed in the unit cost in a person month. So this means that for each person month justified, the living allowance will be 3.4 thousand euros multiplied with the country correction coefficient. This is to ensure that the researchers, wherever they go, they have equal treatment and purchasing power. There is a difference between the countries. Some countries are more cheaper, some countries are more expensive. So we apply this country correction coefficient in order to level and to uh, skip the bias in some countries. Mobility allowance is for researcher to move because uh, that researcher can have some, uh, some uh, uh, jobs to do and also needs to visit the family. So there is a mobility allowance, but also if the researcher is married or has a partner that would like to bring with, it, it's entitled for uh, 660 euros for each researcher's month. Then we have this specific long-term leave allowance and special need allowance that are, that are de defined in the project uh, because, for example, special need allowance is for the, uh, for the uh, people that have some uh, deficiencies like uh, uh, sight impairment or hearing impairment, so they can apply for these special need uh, allowances or long-term leave allowance in case of sickness and such things. Then, these are the uh, researcher's cost, but parallel to the researcher's cost, the institution that receives the researcher is entitled to use this funding. Uh, again, this funding is given to the researcher. So if we talk about research training and networking contribution from this funding, for example, the institution can send the researcher to the conference and pay the costs of the conference or pay the costs of publishing of the paper in the, in the peer magazine. And also management and indirect contribution that goes to the institution that hosts the researcher. Next slide, please. So which project is going to be awarded with the grant? Next slide, please. The criteria are only three. It is excellence, impact and quality and efficiency of the implementation like it is in the whole horizon program but we need to pay attention on this line here which is waiting so when we are evaluating the proposals of maris Klodowska key reactions the most of interest is to look at the excellence of the doctoral network, which means quality and pertinence of the objectives proposed methodology and credibility of the training program but this is not sufficient itself. We also need to check the quality of the supervision. What it means? It means that the researcher, first of all, has to be very good researcher to prove it by his biography and his details. Then also, sorry, not researcher, the supervisor, because researchers are going to be invited on the competitive days. So the supervisors that are involved in the network, they need to put the CVs and prove the meritum of their work. Then the training program, how it is composed, which elements in research the, these PhD students are going to advance. Then the, how it is going to be done in the research aspect. So when we talk about the methodology and the credibility here, in the excellence, we are talking about the research point of view, not on this one that is on the opposite side of the table, quality and efficiency of, the, of implementation. This is how the project is going to be done. But the core of the project is this. Therefore, the weighting is 50% for the excellence, 30 for impact, because impact is very important in the, in the case of, uh, of uh, Horizon Europe, 
and also 20% only for the quality and efficiency of implementation. So one has to bear in mind the excellence and impact, but also the quality and efficiency in less input. Next, uh, next slide, please. How to apply? Uh, first of all, next slide. First of all, it is important to, to get uh, introduced with the funding and tenders portal, which is the single stop shop for anything that is happening in Horizon Europe. And you can go for searching funding and tenders menu. And then when you click, you will get one simple, uh, one simple, one simple search facility where you need to select the program period like 2127 Horizon Europe program. And also you can uh, type MSCA doctoral networks in the search field. Then it will, if you selected 2027, 2127 and Horizon Europe, you will at the moment have these two only. So there is a call for uh, doctoral networks 2023, but also the call for doctoral networks in 24. So well, already a year in advance, you know when the call for the 2024 will be known. So it's simply you click on the call identifier Next slide, please. And the new screen is going to appear with the text for that call. So you need to browse through all of these sections on the left-hand side of the menu. General data about the project, uh, topic description, expected outcomes. There you have uh, uh, very important documents to read, like uh, also evaluators a uh, paper that evaluators are getting to evaluate your proposal so you can see what they're supposed to find in your proposal but also you have here uh, uh, partner search announcements in case that you need partner for your network to to make your network bigger next slide please so Presume that you have studied everything and you decided that you want to go for the doctoral network, uh, which is a thematic doctoral network, not industrial, not joint doctorate. So you need to press one of these radio buttons here at the section start submission to download the template for your application. So first select the action you want and start submission. Then you will get one pop-up window that you have to confirm and prior to that, you need to be logged in in the system. Then after that, next slide, please, if everything is okay. On the next slide, you will get this screen and you need to download this zip file that is given here. On the left-hand side, download part B templates. Inside this zip document, there is a one Word file and a word, one MS Excel file. And this is at the same time, the place where you start submission of the proposal together uh, with the supervisors. So it means the one that is a coordinator, it will start to fill in these details here. But for you that you want to write the proposal, this is the part B template where you need to find it. This is the only one. No other locations are important for doctoral networks except these templates that are here. Later on in the submission phase, you will first need to convert these documents into PDF and upload them in the step six in the proposal forms and then submit it. So it, everything happens here. It goes from the start submission button and everything happens on that server later. Next slide, please. So uh, the, 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 uh, the process of submission is composed of two parts. Part A, is the structured data. On the previous screen, you have seen some pick po points and some in contact, etc. So this is the place where we start to fill in the part A or structured data about the participating institutions in the program. So this is electronically done. So the coordinator enters the PIC code, enters the contacts of the partners in the consortium. And after that, we are going for the part B that we downloaded. The first page looks exactly like this. Next slide, please. Yeah, the part B is maximum 30 pages. There is a limitation. So how it goes? First, you read MSA work program and guidance documents to introduce yourself to the program and how it works. Use the template proposal as I explained then read carefully the evaluation form that you can find under the topic documents. Then don't underestimate any part of the proposal, regardless they are 50, 30, 20 divided. You have to describe all of them very thoroughly. 
then write each section clearly and in coherence with the sections in proposal. Let someone else read what you have write to cross check if it's correct or not. You can do that in a consultation with the national contact points. And with this, you need also to complete part A. Then when you complete part A and part B, it is you are ready to, uh, to submit the proposal. The important sentences, think like an evaluator and write as a uh, write for an evaluator, what it means. Your proposal will be uh, seen by the three uh, evaluators. All of them are from three different countries, from three different backgrounds, and they must understand you in the same way. So they must understand what you wanted to say with your proposal. Next slide, please. So these are the work programs uh, uh, information about the next calls. You see that uh, this this call for 2023 is going to close on 28th of November. So you still have time to do something. And this is the indicative timeline. So after the 28th November, in April, there will be notification on successful participants. The grant agreement is going to be signed in July and the first projects will start in August 224. So it means there is a certain period of eight months for the evaluation of proposal and for the grant signatory phase. And you have to count on this, especially if you are belonging into the last two years of your PhD study. And the next one in 2024 will have the deadline in uh, November 20, 2024. So they are uh, published once per year. And you see here uh, corresponding budget for each of, of, these, of these calls. So uh, very simple. And this is the same scheme that is going to be repeated for the 2024, but just in a different, this part will be in 25. Next slide, please. These are the links to be consulted just for you because the presentation will be available. I hope the links also will be clickable. Next slide, please. So about the participation of the third can program third countries. We divide the program third countries, as I said, in the two groups. The one is a low and middle income countries, for example, like Vietnam. And the others are in high income countries like Japan and Singapore. So there is a uh, distinction between these two. Uh, the low and middle income countries are automatically eligible to participate, uh, but high income countries have to pay for their participation in the program. So we will see that there is a possibility for participation in Marie Sklodowska Kiri doctoral networks, even without the paying of the participation. Next slide, please. So the participation rule is that the low and middle income countries can be beneficiaries and partner organizations, while high, high income countries can be only partner organizations. So low and middle income countries can receive EU funds and the high income countries cannot receive EU funds. So it means very simple. If we look uh, at the uh, context of the doctoral networks where the researchers are flowing between the countries, the researchers from other countries can come to high income countries and they will be paid for, for the project, depending on the duration, duration of their stay in that institution. So uh, as an example, if researcher from Europe is coming to Japan, the hosting institution in Japan will receive the money for that researcher's cost by the partner that is sending that researcher. So all the costs that researcher is going to, to create during this uh, stay at the, at the host institution are covered by this institution. So therefore, you now understand that sending from Japan outside to Europe is not possible direction. So because they can be sent, but under the cost of the, of the institution that is sending it. So this is the distinction. While the low income and middle income countries, they can flow in both directions. Next slide, please. Okay. Where to find the positions for the doctoral networks? It's very simple. Go to your access portal and click on jobs and funding. And then on that menu, click on find funding. Next slide, please. This kind of 
screen you will get if you select HE stroke MSCA, which means Horizon Europe Marie Sklodowska key reactions. So now the system will list you all open positions relevant to Marie Sklodowska key reactions, and you can see which of them are belonging to the postdoctoral fellowships or to the doctoral fellowships. So for example, this one, click on the title, next slide please, PhD positions in political science and European science, and it will give you the full picture of the position. So all information that you need to apply, uh, you will find it here. When it starts, which kind of research field it is, what, what kind of funding, for whom, because here it's very important to see for whom it is. It's written first stage researchers are one up to the point of PhD. So this means this, uh, this uh, call here uh, has been extracted from doctoral network. Someone from doctoral network published this call. And then on the bottom, when you, screen, uh, when you scroll down, you will find the contact information. You need to address that person and to express your interest to, for that position and then to follow up their, their uh, rules how to do it. Uh, one important issue to say is that the European Union uh, member states are obliged to use your actual jobs to post every possible uh, research position at the universities or in industry. So it's very welcome that you visit regularly this site and also to find, the, find your position. Next slide, please. So instead of the conclusion, I would just like to underline that the researchers from Japan are eligible in uh, Marie Sklodowska key reaction as presented. They're more eligible in postdoctoral fellowship because they can move to Europe in that case. But there is always necessity to find European host or partner. My advice is to register at your access and also at your access Japan. To, if you uh, register to your access portal, it will allow you to upload your CV so that the institutions can find you. And if you're registered at your access Japan, you will be able to receive in time and uh, all information that is necessary to have for uh, uh, following up and participating in the Horizon Europe program. But it is important that you are the ones doing these steps because you must be proactive and try and don't ever give up. Next slide, please. Why don't give up? Because regardless the funding that you have and regardless the skills that you have, you always can be one of these two types. So it's up to you what you are going to do. Next slide, please. Also, there is, no, there is a not important what resources you have at disposal if you don't know how to use them. It's very important to read a lot of documents to prepare this, this uh, uh, project proposal. Next slide, please. Also, uh, you can not do anything if your hands are in your pockets. So you have to shall we say, get dirty and start to do something and be proactive in order to, to make the success. And also, next slide, please. It is never too late. Sometimes because you are delayed can be advantage because you already have seen how it functions. You already have seen the others, how they do it. So you can be in advantage for this. Okay, next slide, please. With this, I would like to thank you for listening to me. I hope that uh, it was sufficient, not overloading with information. I would again like to invite you to read the documents on the doctoral networks and also Marie Curie uh, work program, because a lot of information is there. Ask the assistance from the national contact points for Marie Sklodowska key reactions. They are more, moreover in every country represented. So be advised that they are first hand assistance to you in the preparation of proposal or any question that you have related to this. Thanks a lot. And I hand up to uh, Judith. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dalibor, for the very extensive explanation of the MSC doctoral networks. I would like to apologize for the technical glitches. As you can see, we do not have a room view at the moment. And while we've tried to uh, rectify that problem during the presentation, I'm afraid we weren't too successful about that. Let me just invite our next speaker. If uh, we have him online, yes. I would like to invite uh, Professor Martin Embley from Newcastle University.
to talk about MSc Doctoral Networks in the Natural Sciences. Martin, if um, you could please unmute yourself. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk. And greetings to everyone from England. Uh, I'm based in the UK, as you can see, in the north of England. Um, I've been involved with the uh, Mary Slodowska Curie action since 2006, both as a host for doctoral candidates and uh, individual fellowships, and also as an expert evaluator. So I've seen both sides of the coin. Okay, so why should you participate in a doctoral network? I would encourage you to do so. There are advantages both as a host and as a doctoral candidate. For hosts, it provides an opportunity to collaborate with scientists from different sectors across Europe, exchange students to access different high-level expertise, infrastructure, and environment. So if you don't have high-level proteomics, for example, in your institute, you can collaborate with someone who does. You can also host our highly motivated and productive doctoral candidates and bring new skills to your lab. As a doctoral candidate, there's a lot uh, you can gain from participating in a doctoral network. You can work and train within a supportive network on related projects and goals. You can live and work in different countries. You can experience different labs and environments. You can also build personal contacts and increase your skills to improve your productivity, your horizons, and eventually your employability in the long term. So I'll give you an example of a doctoral network that I was involved in. Uh, this, is, this was called Symbiomics, Molecular Ecology and Evolution of Bacterial Symbionts. Okay, um, the results of this doctoral network are on the CORDIS site, that's the link. So you can read more about what we did, why we did it and what we produced on that site. But basically, um, it, the network comprised 19 research groups, five private sector partners, 14 doctoral candidates, and it was coordinated by the Max Planck Institute in Bremen, Germany. And I was a member of this network. The EU contribution was substantial, so doctoral networks can attract a large amount of money. Uh, so there were 3,782,000 uh, euros. We had network-wide activities, including research, joint research, secondments, one student moving between two or more different labs, workshops and courses, regular thesis committee meetings, so joint supervision of students, and mentoring. There was interdisciplinary training for the uh, doctoral candidates in our network in molecular techniques, confocal and microspectroscopy, genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and bioinformatics. And there were field workshops on the ecology of marine symbioses. We provided training and produced original science that exceeded what each partner could achieve alone. So by collaborating both at the doctoral candidate level and at the host level, we did much better science. And we could form long lasting collaborations. I still collaborate with members of the network. By 2019, so the network ran from 2011 to 2014, by 2019, the doctoral network had published two book sections and 33 papers, and I think there are 10 more since then. All of the doctoral candidates next to the symbiomics doctoral candidates. Well, I'll talk about two examples. Uh, on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see Casper. Casper Sendra was the doctoral candidate working in my laboratory. On the right-hand side of the slide, you can see Daryl Doman. Daryl was the doctoral candidate working in the University of Vienna. And then in the slide on the left, you can also see Tom Williams. Tom Williams was a uh, Mary Slodowska Curie um, individual fellow working in my lab at the same time. And those three individuals collaborated to produce papers um, by Daryl coming to my lab at Newcastle and working for uh, a month 
with Tom Williams to analyze some data that he generated. And they got a very nice paper together in Nature Communications, as you can see on the slide. Casper also worked with Tom and he worked with other members of the consortium to get some really nice papers, one on transporter genes in um, Nature Communications and a first author paper in PLOS Pathogens. So you can see uh, that all of the students doctoral candidates were very successful. And Daryl went on to be an assistant professor in the University of New Mexico. Casper is still working at the University of Newcastle uh, as a postdoctoral worker. And Tom Williams is now working at the participants. Um, so I told you that I've been an evaluator as well as a host, um, and I'd like to give you some tips uh, for applying when applying for a, a doctoral network. Uh, firstly, give yourself plenty of time to write the proposal. They are substantial documents, so start well before the deadline. If you end up rushing at the end, you won't do a very good job, and that will reduce your chances of being successful. Write simply and clearly so that all of the expert evaluators can fully appreciate the importance of the work and the training. You'll have three expert evaluators, but they may not be experts in your area. So you've got to write sufficiently clearly so they can understand the importance of your work. Okay. Make sure you meet all of the evaluation criteria. You're given the evaluation criteria in the document, so make sure that you meet them and make sure that the evaluators can see that you meet the evaluation criteria. Include any supporting documents and make it clear to the expert evaluators that you are meeting all of the evaluation criteria. Doctoral network applications typically have three criteria to be assessed. In 2022, these were excellence, impact, and implementation. So that's three sections, and each of them has subsections. All of them need to be met completely. It's no good writing excellent science and not having a good impact section or a good implementation section. You've got to really have three very good sections to score highly enough to be considered for funding. So don't spend all of your time in the science and then rush through the other two sections because you will not get funded because you will not score sufficiently highly. Be specific and credible about planned events. Yeah? So don't say you're going to do things without sufficient detail for an evaluator to be certain that you are going to do those things and you are able to do those things. Make clear responsibilities of different partners and different students, where people are going to be trained and when. Timings and duration are important. Are they credible? Can they be completed within the time frame of the network? And don't forget potential risks and their mitigation. And lastly, if members of your network have been successful in the past, ask if you can see the successful applications. Okay. How did they approach the different sections? How did they approach the different challenges? Okay. So you can learn from those, but do not copy. Okay. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you so much for uh, the description of uh the doctoral network that you participated in. And we would like to welcome the next speaker in a very similar genre and welcome questions during the Q&A, if you do not mind staying on till then. So our next speaker who talks about MSc doctoral networks in the social sciences and humanities is Professor Dr. Uh, Ivan Michelangelo D'Aprile from the University of Potsdam. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Good Please. afternoon from Berlin. Um, thank you for having me in your wonderful event, and I try to share the screen. Okay. So in addition to what my colleagues already said, I just want to very briefly add some specificities on, on doctoral networks in the social sciences and the humanities. Um, social sciences and humanities are an um, uh, integral part of, of the European research agenda. Uh, and we had an increasing number of applications and also funded projects uh, in the last 10 years in 
Marie Curie doctoral network. So I really would like to encourage you, even if you're coming from humanities and social sciences, uh, to think about applications in this uh, scheme of funding. Also in the social sciences, as in the whole program, we have a bottom-up approach. So um, the networks are open to all topics and disciplines from the humanities and social sciences. Um, you can come from, and we invite researchers from sociology, political science, law, communication, psychology, philosophy, history, education, or literature uh, to participate in the program. The idea is that you apply with an interdisciplinary project, so bringing together some of the mentioned disciplines to one research topic, uh, which with you then uh, write your application. We already heard a lot of detail about the structure and participants in doctoral networks, so I can keep this quite briefly. The structure is the same for all for all disciplines. We have um, a number of beneficiaries, at least uh, from three uh, EU member state countries and a number of associated partners. And these can be um, academic institutions, higher education institutions, research or organizations, uh, as well as non-academic um, institutions. It is always not that easy to uh, to find non-academic uh, or has been for a long time not that easy um, for projects in the humanities to find non-academic institutions as partners. But as I said, we have a long history of, of funding in the humanities and there are a number of typical types so to speak, of non-academic organizations in doctoral networks and humanities. These can be archives, libraries, museums, NGOs, um, uh, Dalibor mentioned hospitals. These can be also uh, small and medium enterprises or non-profit organizations, for example, from heritage industries, cultural industries, from the tourism sector or di digital technologies. Uh, we invite, as we already heard, in the doctoral networks, um, early stage researchers from all over the world and also from Japan to apply for the positions which are advertised once a doctoral network is funded. And normally each uh, doctoral network uh, funds and advertises 10 doctoral research positions which are uh, advertised at Eurexcess. Uh, so please have a look if you are, um, for example, an excellent master student from Japan, if there's something which might be of interest for you. Each of the um, recruited researcher will be enrolled in a European PhD program at the hosting university. And as we already heard, um, the researchers must not have obtained a PhD degree um, at the moment of the application. So this is directed to uh, early stage researchers before the PhD, because the PhD will then be achieved during the, uh, during the program. Yeah, I think we uh, already had a lot of information. And of course, I'm open to questions um, on, on um, aspects in the social sciences and humanities, if there are some. Um, as I said, it, it has been uh, in the beginning of European research funding, um, it has been very much directed to product-oriented product research, uh, research in the natural sciences. Um, but in the last years, uh, the European Union uh, a lot of effort to also fund uh, projects in social sciences and humanities, and uh, you are very much invited to, to participate in our programs. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much for the explanation about uh, the social sciences with reference to MSC doctoral networks. And we would like to open the questions. I would like to encourage those who are present in the room and those of you that are online to please post your queries. If you would like to post a question online, I would like to ask you to type them up in the Q&A box in the webinar panel. So please type up any questions that you may have. Do we have any questions from the room? I can um, give you a microphone if you like. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for your opportunity. Uh, my name is Alvin. Uh, I would like to know uh, the is the, the doctoral network in this session was uh, provided by uh, was also provide a job career for a doctoral student from the in, in Japan University. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, I'm not exactly sure if any of you can answer that. That's probably my job to connect with you uh, by email in the future, or we can also meet up and I can give you advice. So the question was to actually find um, uh, positions at Japanese universities. Uh, I will get in touch with you. Okay, so we can actually talk about that in the future. Uh, again, I will be happy to answer any queries with reference to um, collaborations with uh, European institutes and also Japanese institutes and sort of uh, help set up consortia between institutions uh, on both sides of, um, of this webinar, Europe and Japan. And if you have any queries that might be relevant to our speakers who are online and in the room, please type them up in the Q&A box. We have one question. How competitive is the MSC doctoral network, especially for Japanese candidates? How competitive is it? Any of the speakers online would care to answer that or? It's, can I say something? It's the the networks getting funding in the networks is very competitive. Um, I've seen a lot of very high quality applications, um, including people from all over the world. I've had people from Argentina working in my lab. I've had people from China, and uh, I've liaised with people in Japan over the years. So there's there's no. Um, difference wherever you come from it's it's a highly competitive process but there's no reason why someone from japan shouldn't be successful in that process we've got the same chance as everyone else yes thank you uh it seems that dalibor would like to say a few words yes i would like to invite because this is a prestigious program and normally it is expected that there is a, some level of competition and you need to prove yourself that you are uh that you earn this position in the in the doctoral networks. So you need to be good with your papers up to the, that position and with your work to prove it that you're worthwhile to participate. It is important that you show yourself in the best light. So don't wait the last date to show that, but build up your research career in advance in order to get the possibilities to, to be selected for such position. But it is highly uh, it is highly competitive normally because there are a lot of PhD candidates all over the world. And the second, the benefits of the of the fellowship are really, as you could see on the example of these two professors, that those 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 students they continue with the Marie Skudowska key reactions and they continue on the better and better positions. First the assistant professor, then associated professor. So it just gives you a push in your back. So I would like to invite you to try at least not to give it uh, as an open opportunity and then not, not to use it so much. Any further questions? Uh, Judith, may I add something to, to the question before? Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Just two uh, really brief uh, aspects. I really would like to, um, to encourage you to apply because the, the recruitment and, and selection process is really open in, in the Marie Curie doctoral networks, much more open than on the national level, I would say, because in, in research funding on the national level, you have often the case that the professors already know somebody and, and want to recruit somebody as a doctoral student. 
whereas on the European level, these are really open, um, open um, selection processes, and you really have the chance to to get a position there. Uh, if you're coming from Japan, this was one aspect, and the second aspect is that the positions are really attractive for for doctoral students because you don't get only a stipend, which is normally the case, for example, in Germany, if you are a doctoral student, you get a stipend for research, but you get a full, full contract um, at a European university for three years, which means you also have social insurance, you have mobility allowances, and so on. So these are really attractive positions, I would say, for young, young researchers. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Okay, we have another question online. When drafting a proposal, what kind of support can I get from the NCP? Do they do one-on-one -on -one consultation? I believe this is a question to Dolibor again. Yes. Thanks a lot for the question. Yeah, the NCP is your first point of contact. First of all, they will explain you the whole process and they will guide you in this process. However, NCPs are, do not write the proposals. So simply, they don't write the proposal instead of you. They just help you in writing of your proposal and they give you the instructions how to adapt the text to certain section. Because some sections of the proposal have to be written strictly in research manner, while the other parts of the proposal should be given also in a, in a manner to be understood by the common public. So in more general language, especially impact. Impact you have to prove that that you are going to affect these areas that you have uh, that uh, that are supposed to be affected with your proposal. So the NCPs, yes, they can help you. Usually they have organizing uh, in the local languages. They are organizing training sessions. They are distributing different information documents, and you can contact them for one-on-one -on -one events or one-on-one -on -one consultations. It just depends on their free time and depends on the number of the of the candidates that would like to to collaborate with them and don't forget that usually there is a one ncp per country dealing with all five type of actions so they can be sometimes overloaded with jobs so be patient but they will definitely uh, very be very happy to help you to be to be online to be in in a, in a process of the of the submission of the proposal also uh the proposal submission is going to be done between the institutions. So if you are a PhD candidate, do not overload yourself with this, uh, uh, with this information too much because it is much more important for you to know where to find the open positions and how to apply to these open positions that I have presented in my presentation. So it is more important that you are frequently visiting your access uh, jobs portal and to find out if there is a position for your, for your, uh, for your uh, uh, domain or in research. Thank you very much, Dalibor. Any other questions? So I have a question. So if uh, my research on my master's study and the doctoral study is different, does it uh, give an impact for evaluations? If I can ask, answer this question, I would yes, also sir, like Dalibor. to hear the opinion from the professors that uh, professor that was an evaluator, but in general, you need to prove the state of the art and you need to prove that your research is going to make a step forward. So something that you have done in the in your uh, master thesis is upgraded with the doctoral thesis, but it has to give this state of the art improvement in this respect. So yeah, I, I believe uh, the transfer is yes. So it's no problem to continue with this, but you must find a relevant network where you can continue with this uh, program. Thank you so much for um, for the answer. Any further questions? I actually see some of them in the Q&A box. OK, so uh, thank you for the questions. The next one, in short, supervisors write proposal and upon acceptance, they open up positions in that project. And then we being PhD candidates apply via your access, question mark. Yes. Thank you for the question. The uh, your access jobs is the place where you will find the initial information. So it means like in the official gazette or whatever you need, uh, you're obliged to publish this competition. 
and then you are contacting the person that is behind the this uh, this grant so after the after you visit your access jobs you are going to be transferred to that institution that is uh, engaging the researcher so for example if the, if it's a, a case of university of uh, some country uh, on that uh, site on uh, your access jobs you will have email address or even the telephone number in order to contact that person and address with your cv requesting to enter the competition for for that position so uh, not msea website not your access but the institution that is going to receive this researcher yes thank you for the cl uh, clarification on that the next question is an industrial institution with an interest to participate how could I do that? Do I need to find an interested Japanese doctorate, a doctorate candidate first, doctoral candidate first? In a principle, doctoral networks are constructed by the will of institutions to participate. So there is a program behind this, and this program should already involve industrial partners. So it means the industrial partners must be known from the beginning, except in case when the industrial partner is associated partner, where the uh, where the student is going as an, uh, uh, will, be, uh, will be seconded to the industrial capacity. So, uh, only in that case, you need to find an associated partner to go to that uh, to that settlement, to that industry. So in the beginning, it, it needs to be defined, especially in industrial uh, fellowships, you need to have in industrial doctoral networks, uh, you need to have institution already in a consortium as a beneficiary. So it is already known among the partners. But in case that uh, the student is going to be seconded to associated partner for part of the work, that is something else. But in case of industrial fellowships, it must be done in advance. Hope this is, this clarifies. Uh, and also, I would invite uh, other speakers if they can provide more information on this. Any comments from our speakers from Europe? Yes, maybe just one brief comment. I think the normal procedure is that um, that the academic institutions second uh, the doctoral students to to industrial partners. So the the cooperation which you are asking for is um, maybe first not so much um, as Dalibor said, not so much between you and the doctoral candidates, but first of all between you and the higher education institution. And then you are hosting together a doctoral candidate uh, who is enrolled at, at the academic institution. Thank you for the additional information on that. Any further questions? I am a PhD candidate. Do I have to contact directly to the concerned person institute through Eurexas and further discussion and acceptance will be based with them? Question mark again. Yes, as I mentioned already, you need to go to the Euraccess uh, Jobs website to find this position, and there you will find the information to whom to contact and to whom to continue in uh, in elaboration of your capacities and the in your application process. Yes, so you you go you are contacting the institution. But there is another question. Thank you so much for this session. Very welcome, and uh, this will also be. Uh, uploaded on our YouTube channel so you can rewatch it for further information. And we would like to ask you to follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, well, X, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, and also every now and then check out our portal. Yes, let me invite our closing speaker, Heinz Berens, First Consular, Head of Science, Innovation, Digital, and Other EU Policy section at the Delegation of European Union to Tokyo to deliver his uh, closing remarks. Guys, if you can please stand right here, and uh, due to these technical glitches, which is this is the best we can do, with uh, uh, regard to having a, a camera. So, good evening, everyone here in Tokyo, and good morning, everyone in Europe. Uh, indeed, my name is Gijs Berens. I'm the head of the science and innovation section here at the EU delegation to Japan. We're very happy to be hosting this event. Uh, I think it's been very successful, so I would like at the outset immediately extend a warm thanks to Judith of your access, to Dalibor for speaking here in Tokyo, and for Mr. Demli and Mr. D'April who are speaking online. 
uh, big thanks to all of you uh, because I think it, really, it feels we really benefited from a rather rich overview of what it means to be part of the MSCA Doctoral Networks program. We got a very good summary of all the opportunities that it brings. Just to highlight a few that, uh, that we heard uh, over the last hour and a half, it creates new partnerships. And if you also follow Mr. Demley's and Mr. Dabghi's presentation, they are actually long lasting partnerships. It helps train skills, but also transfer these skills. It leads to creative and high level publications. And not only does it improve the job prospects of individual researchers, but also it strengthens the research entities themselves. So overall, I think what it really does is it's spreading excellence and, and that is something really worthwhile. I also think we didn't shy away from some of the problems. Is it very difficult to apply? Does it take too much time? Is it too competitive? But uh, also there, I think we gave at least some answers. We pointed everyone to, for instance, a national contact point. We pointed them to the frequently asked questions, to the, 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 the portals on uh, our own website and the portals of your access. And I think these are all useful um, pieces of information for everyone to have. And maybe to conclude, as Mr. Demley said, you have to give yourself some time and not give up and try to, to make the best out of the opportunities that there are there. Talking about time, I think with that, I would like to thank you all very much. Uh, I hope you thought it was useful. Judith, I don't know if you want to close it yourself, but uh, everyone, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, indeed, I would like to say just a few more words. We will have uh, another MSCA webinar. That's not going to be a hybrid event. It's going to be a webinar on the 29th of November about staff exchange opportunities and advice on how to actually apply. So please tune in 29th of November. Thank you for coming today. And we hope to see you again in our future events. And with that, I wish you a good evening and a wonderful day if you're in Europe. Goodbye.